you all for the honor of this opportunity to address you. Um, it really is an honor. I mean, you know, and in ways some of you may not even realize, but as uh, I speak and as this conference unfolds, you'll see what I think. Because, you know, it's interesting. We're here in St. Louis, just around the block from where the Dred Scott decision was made. That was a world in which nobody wanted to hear anything from somebody like me. That was a world in which so many people in this room went within the orbit, not only of the question of human behavior, but even within the very notion of having a point of view. So in many ways, although Lewis Gordon is here, I'm not really here as Lewis Gordon. I'm here in a unique relationship that manifests something we all share. Because we have to understand that, and as I speak, we'll see, the extent to which we fail to see our collective responsibility for the face of ethical life, we harm each other. So I thank you for that honor. Because in many, in the respect you give me, it's not only the respect I have for you, but for each of us to respect for ourselves. Now, greetings and thanks to Peg Simmons. <laughs> what energy, fierce. <laughs> yeah, you know, as I say, you go, girl. <laughs> initiated and there are many things I'm Peg is still trying to figure out what's going on because you know when she asked for she contacted me and we are seeing right now in this meeting you know we can get some music we could say this is how we do it <laughs> right you know one of the big problems with philosophy is uh, you know it's uh, and I'll, I'll talk about it but you know there's something profoundly to livability in humanity, philosophy. And sometimes our training makes us forget that ethical face of life I talk about. So Peg is realizing, you know, people tell us we're supposed to do things one way, but why do we have to? There are many ways to do things. And in fact, especially with existentialism, we're the ones who talk about a spirit of seriousness and the fact that we should remember that we create the rules. We break them, we change them. Now, and Jane Gordon, our fearless leader of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, um, you know, um, some, of, some of you have known me for years, many years. And uh, one of the things, and I'm going to mention some of my students in a moment, but. I was, I, one thing I do is I take a lot of my students out when we study, because I, you know, you could be in a classroom, there's a lot of learning that happens when you relax. There's no accident, but I think a quintessential ancient text on philosophy that's supposed to be not republic is the drinking party. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but one of the things is, one of my students, uh, when you relax, you can be yourself, and, you know, there are people who have, uh, seeing my brain at work and it scares the shit out of me. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, one of my students once said is, um, how could someone be married to you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, and I, you know, I'm a CV, I just said, you know, I was lucky I found somebody who's brilliant. <laughs> I've met somebody who had no second since the day I met her has ever done anything short of challenging. So you can see she brings that love and spirit to the organization. And we're here with an understanding of what it is. Uh, you know, people get pokey about it. You know, one of the things, if you look at my books, I've never written a book in which there are not women writers I've cited. And it's not the fact that the text with women. It's just that we forget that if we really think about the ideas, 
ideas just simply aren't exclusively produced by the media. And the fact of the matter is that within that framework, I know what it's like and have seen what it's like to be inspired by thought that really changes me. And many of you know from my writings, I do not believe that we are self-contained metaphysical substances that willy-nilly generate thought. Thought is first and foremost relationships. And so, although I'm standing before you, I can say absolutely that it's we who are here. In addition to that, I'd like to mention uh, thanks to, you know, not only the CPA committee, the executive committee, but the Collegium of Black Women in Philosophy. And, you know, the work that Kathy Bynes is doing, I mean, a lot of people think about it simply in terms of firsts or uh, uh, black women in philosophy, but a lot of things, and as I speak, you'll see what I mean, the work she's doing is more than a question of getting a group of people together to talk about black women in philosophy. And as I speak, you're going to see what I mean by this. What she's doing is fundamental, and it's connected to what the individuals who created the Beauvoir Society have done. In fact, what we did in the creation of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. What Leonard Harris has done in Philosophy Born Struggle, I'm so happy that many of you are here. With Sophia, or well, Sophia, the way it's pronounced today, the Belo Ponte Society, the Sartre Society, and the France Finance Foundation. Merveille, Fanon Mendes France. For all your hard work. And congratulations also, we're going to do that tomorrow, but to the winners of the awards. Because you bring, you're, you're connected to something more than simply your work, as you will see tomorrow. Now there's joy for me on many other levels as well. Because, Tommy Locke, where are you? I don't see him right now. Well, <laughs> I saw Tommy Locke today. You know, Tommy Locke, yeah, you, you all will see later. I mean, not only raise the collaborations he did with Berlusconi and a lot of the other work. But there's so many things around Tommy Locke that don't get the uh, proper, you know, acknowledgement. Now, the beginning of this talk is going to be full of lists, and you'll see why. Now, I want to thank my colleagues, but I also want to give a shout out to my colleagues who are former students. Because I didn't think about it. We were just doing this, but so many former students are here, and they're not colleagues. So cool. And you have to picture this. Last Saturday is my, my our youngest son's bar mitzvah. So the idea that my, young, my youngest son's bar mitzvah, and then uh, here I am, you know, the whole question of adultery and maturation is part of my writing, as Barbara Gibson's about to point out. And so for me, there's nothing more important. You see, what when you work with your students, it's, it's not it's not the same where I don't call it the Daedalus model where you tell the Icarus to follow you behind. The per what we're trying to do is to get our students to understand their own freedom and intellect and go out and do things that are marvelous. And I had such a great experience today listening to a panel where I forgot they were my students because I was just checking at these cool scholars, really getting a minute, and very good. I said, oh wait a minute, I know them. <laughs> and I took out the old iPhone and I took some pictures. And that is going to be one of the most profound moments for the teacher. So I want to give a shout out to Doug Feitchel. Sometimes he says Feitchel, but I can't help but remember the graphs that are just. Tom Fordham, Leo Levy, Walter Isaac, Preston Mason, Gina Faust, Mike Monahan, Greg Graham, Terrence Johnson, Devon Johnson, Vince Beaver, Daniel Asusa, Justin Pugo. Catherine Whitsitt, and uh, you know, and then there are people indirectly. It's just so wonderful to see you all here. Now I'm going to begin by just giving a book list from three syllables. Three syllables, just, and you'll get the point as anyway. I'll start the first one. This uh, this course had a its syllabus had a book called. Philosophical Meditations of Richard Wright, edited by James Hyland. Frantz Fanon, Black Steel White Mask. Charles E. Pratt, <coughs> Pathology of Eurocentrism. 
get some guy to do his question. Let's get back. Uh, David Fryer, Thinking Clear. Naomi Zach, Race and Mixed Race. Linda Alcock, Visible Identities. Um, then I bring up another course. The texts. Richard Wright, Native Son. Richard Wright, The Outsider. Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man. James Baldwin, Another Country. Toni Morrison, Bluest Eye. Then I'm popped up again, Lexi White Bass. Cornel West, Race Matters. Malefe Asante, The Afrocentric Idea. And Dio Linked, Team Up, did I do that right, Bumbledo? I, I teach those in South Africa. Right. 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 Okay, so I got it. <laughs> With Amanda Alexander Nigel Gibson, Eco Lives. Okay? And the last course. Sylvan Kierkegaard, Fear and Trembling. Now, the moment I said that, many of you all think what the next book is, but just check out the next book. <coughs> Siri Arabindo, the future of the future evolution of man. Carl Jaspers, philosophy of existence. Alisha Riyati, man in Islam. Jean-Paul Sartre, being and nothingness. Simone de Beauvoir, the ethics of ambiguity. Kaiji Nishitani, religion and nothingness. No Tubani Bangani, being black in the world. Now what's interesting is that last one, its title was the one with four, that course was black intervention. And the one before that was race and existence. And maybe wonder why did I bring up this? All right? Well, I bring this up because there's already an issue about how we talk about it. And although there are many more names I could consider, here are some, for instance, when people talk about existentialism, you know, one of the things that happen is there's an absence of much intellectual courage in the academy. And so what people do consistently is they function like idealists and encourage, but not like a person. They just keep want to follow the same, you know, it, it's like the old myth of the vampire, you know, the vampire myth. <laughs> Which is if you if a vampire comes up, if you throw grain or salt in the ground, they gotta count it. Obsessive problems of you know the good vampire is like, I will drink your blood, but later. But you know, it's like they stop learning. It takes some time. So they don't here's some people. I just like to you keep in mind as I speak, right? I say a Jabbar from Algeria. You read her writing. There's no way you can Henry and Tigo. I didn't mean it. Have come up. Jorge Borges, Argentina. George Lanny and Clevis Headley, Barbados. Paulo Freire and Abdias Nascimento, Brazil. Natalie Eto and Ashila Mbembe, Cameroon. Wang Yang Ming and Luke Song, China. Fernando Gonzalez Aqua and Oscar Guardiola Rivera in the house. <laughs> Colombia. <laughs> Juno Diaz, Dominican Republic. Adel Rahman Badawi, Egypt. Sinai Sarakir Abraham, Eritrea. <coughs> Wilson Harris, Guyana. Edwidge Gantikar and Jacques Bonnet, Haiti. <coughs> Adunjan Mohammed and Nguki Wakiongo, Kenya. Suzanne and Amy Cesare, Martinique. Octavia Paz, Mexico. Chinua Achebe, Abiole Rele, and Fela Kuti. You gotta throw the musician. I mean, any man who would wear red, red on the wear, Ibu man, and sing, you know, Okay? We have Gassan Kamilfani, Palestine. Gloria Comesana, Santalis, Peru. Leopold Singer said, God, send God, or take a cassette, or take a cassette. Come on, you know what I mean? Don Miguel Unamuno. This is all great literature. People are not, people should be teaching, right? 
Stephen Fontubico, Rosina Ma, in the house. <laughs> Where's Rosina? Oh, well, she wasn't. Viva <laughs> 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 Bogomori in the house. There he is, South Africa. Now, interestingly enough, if you put this list in the United States, it's just too many to mention, but I give you a taste of a little, little flavor. You know, a little flavor. All right? James Baldwin, Frederick Douglass, Ralph Nelson, Catherine Dines, and hopefully. Lorraine, Lorraine Hansbury, Langston Hughes, Stephen Haynes, Charles Johnson, William Jones, Neville Larson, Benito Love, Jackie Martinez, Lynn Markson, George Hansen, I could go on. Now, why do I give this list? Well, give me reasons. First of all, I just wanted to give a sense of how vast what we do is and the kind of violence and tragedy with artificially narrowing its scope. In addition to that, one of the things when we bear in mind as we go through this, and by the way, I forgot to make an announcement just in case, since you are now all here, just for it up. Tomorrow the opening poem will be read by Egugi Wationgo, who will be receiving the award tomorrow night. So it's starting three at 845. You know, be there or but for existential, this is serious stuff. Not be. <laughs> <laughs> They'll throw an eye and start. You know, they think the world's complete. <coughs> you know, and you know, I've written a lot of songs, so this is no age. As you know, I'm not against, I don't work with the Manichaean psychologists. But, you know, and you know, it's, it's just, it just boggles my mind how misrepresented. Well, it's not there. What makes matter even worse is existentialism is exciting stuff. Everybody in here who teaches existentialism know this. What you know is there's no such thing as an under-enrolled class in existentialism. <laughs> <laughs> we know it. And that should tell you something. And we have this contradiction. We're in a world where we're always hearing, you know, that young people are a lot more intelligent than we think. Well, their decisions, they're like existentialism. And then a lot of people try to beat the crap out of it, read it out of them. Okay? And what makes matters even worse. We know why a lot of those other people were not included. You know, it's, it's, it's hard, even though they're part of the European Union, we know that Spain, Italy, Greece, and Portugal, you know, it's not really Europe. It's North Africa, <laughs> but, you know. But nevertheless, you know, you know, I'm trying to go to the European. And, uh, but in the framework, we know what's at, what's at stake. And what's at stake there is something I wrote about in an existential outcome, which is, this ridiculous notion that the global south or the far east, indigenous peoples, whatever language you want to call it, at best can offer experience. <laughs> now that's to some extent an upgrade when you think about Dred Scott's <laughs> <laughs> At least there's some experience. <laughs> at least with experience you got point of view. And that's why people ran around talking about well, my experience. I have, I have experience, damn it. But as I put on existential Africa, kind of, that's true. Experience does, it's, it does lead to a problem. Because, you know, in the way I call it, everybody has experience of trying to figure out your experience. And that's one of the reasons why I argue about the relationality of thought. Because when you're trying to figure out your experience, nobody here tries to figure out her or his experience by herself. You're always going to somebody, a confidant, a lover, a best friend, a parent, or whoever it may be. And that tells you that the actual theorizing of experience is relational. You can't do it by yourself. So when you go there, you're now bringing something, a theory to your experience that gives you meaning. But one of the big difficulties, of course, there's not really disagreement with that, even if you go all the way back to Kant, et cetera, et cetera. They say it's cool to go see some theorizing around your experience. Just make sure it be white. <laughs> In a nutshell, the view is theory, the 
ability that involves thinking, and only white people can think. And so, you know, this is something Frederick Douglass talked about. He was like, you know, I mean, that's why he wrote, we wrote his autobiography. When he wrote the narrative, they didn't want to show him to show he could think. Because they know, you know, thinking about black people who think. So he could just show he could experience. But in my bondage, my freedom, and even that I am bondage and freedom, thinking is linked to freedom. And what this tells you then is if you do not take responsibility for thought, then you're going to be dependent on the thought that's given to you, and that thought could also be the thought that militates against your existence. We've called that in our writings, particularly from the Global South and Caribbean philosophy and Africa philosophy, decolonial studies, we call it epistemic dependency. It's a form of epistemological colonization. It's the extent to which the position becomes, yeah, you are not responsible. Now, of course, the big danger is if you say, I'm going to take some thought, damn it. But then you go to the other extreme. Taking the thought means that you forget that not all of the people who are white or European thought in a way that militates against your existence. If thought is relational, it means it's the collective human condition to be responsible for that. So the argument then is about the establishing the relationality of thought, which is one of the reasons why if you read my books and I talk about for instance, when I talk about black existentialism or African existentialism, I don't exclusively talk about it in the terms of black authors. That's why people are a little contradictory with that, right? They say they don't want to deal with race, they want you to be dry. But at the moment you deal with something black and it's multiracial, then they're saying there's then they got a problem with it. But the only way they could is if they do deal with race in a way that collapses into a racialized standpoint of epistemology. If it really is about the ideas, then everybody should be able to participate in feminist thought or about ideas, then it's the responsibility of men to learn feminist thought. If African philosophy is about ideas, it's responsibility of whether you're black, brown, green, blue to learn it. Just like in that syllabus, there were people who are East Indian. I've done work, one of my students is here, uh, she, she's at a gender equality right now in Vietnam, I have no dissertation on Vietnamese existentialism. I've actually learned a lot about the existentialism in Vietnam. So, what is going on here? Well, to deal with this issue, I want to add a concept and explain it to the title. I think one of the big problems, of course, is we have a fallacy in philosophy. Philosophy loves to talk about universality all over the place. But the truth is there's a lot of prejudice. Our philosophy actually doesn't, doesn't, doesn't care about universality except if the person who is speaking is able to articulate his or herself as the universal. And so what, what I say instead is we need something in philosophy like what you have in music. You notice there's this thing called world music? World music. Well, you know, at this about time we had some world philosophy. Philosophy that recognizes the particularity of what advances and pretends its philosophy, that pretends it's universal. And to make this point, we can deal with something that's a series of things that are very insightful from Africana philosophy. For instance, Africana philosophy talks about double consciousness. Double consciousness when you see yourself from the point of view of the dominant images of the society, and you mistakenly believe those points. The problem with that, of course, is that at some point, if you believe that point of view, you become a problem. But what if you find out that you're not a problem? The problem is that society makes you the problem. It's like a story about Richard Wright and Sartre, you know the story? You know, Rich, Sartre goes to hang out with Richard Wright in Harlem. And you know, so you know so we all know Sartre. Sartre folks here. Sartre liked me. You know? <laughs> so Richard Wright knew where to take him, which is Harlem. And Sartre eventually says, you know, Richard. Tell me about the Negro problem. And Richard Wright says, no Negro problem. It's a white problem. <laughs> and we already know the relationship of that. So it's like some interesting Jew. Which is in a true 
Jewish question. Sometimes the question itself is the problem. And then the moment you do this, it's, you discover what's called potentiated double consciousness. You discover, in other words, that, that the contradictions of the previously held position. Now, this movement, this discovery, this consciousness is heavily phenomenological, but it's not only phenomenological, it's also dialectical. Because in articulating the contradictions, you advance knowledge to move forward. You see? Now, it's not linear, it's not progressive form. You don't really know. It's just that it is now, it's just a fact that you know more about something when you find out the contradictions. But it means that you have, we have to overcome a whole bunch of stuff. We have to overcome, for instance, the false dichotomy, dichotomy between existential phenomenology and transcendental phenomenology. You know, you look at some of those debates, it's, you know, I don't know, it's like the blue, what are they, sharks and the jets? <laughs> you know, talk about bloody, right? And, you know, existential, transcendental, transcendental. <laughs> Understand particularly the insights around someone like Husserl when we talked about transcendence. See, a lot of people were still imposing on Husserl and thought, imposing on the and thought, imposing on Beauvoir, imposing on the African thinkers, imposing on a lot of people the presupposition that they were working within a substance based metaphysics in which you can have a self contained, so it's the ego. It's a relationship. And so what happens, one of the things I've argued, I've, I don't have time to get into the details, but one of the things I've argued is that this is the failure to deal with this relationality <laughs> and how these things connect is what leads to the problem of disciplinary decadence. And I've written a book called Disciplinary Decadence. Disciplinary decadence involves all kinds of stuff, but in the short version, it's the fetishization of method and of your discipline. So some people, when they go to do their research, they forget reality. They don't think about relationship to what's out there. They just want to show that they follow the method. They just, have, so analytical philosophers are an example. They want to just show that they're analytical philosophers. And then they're continentalists. who want to show that they're continentalists. And then they collapse into either a textualism or a historicism. And, you know, so from my point of view, for instance, phenomenology proper is not continental in the way it has become. Because it's actually going beyond that. And so what happens with these fetishizing methods is that it becomes almost like Kantian deontologism, which is a categorical narrative. It becomes that you're so locked in it that you forget that your discipline and your method are not reality. So what I've argued around that is that what you need is what I call a teleological suspension of disciplinarity. And that teleological suspension of disciplinarity has paradoxes. It means, for instance, in philosophy, for philosophy to be willing to go beyond philosophy for the sake of reality. And that is one of the things about existential things that bug the crap out of our philosophers. <laughs> it's the real reason why a lot of existentialists didn't call themselves philosophers. And the reason is because they saw philosophy as disciplinarily constraining. They're willing, in other words, to deal with the possibility of that the contours or that which will close it off for its epistemic condition may not be the entire story. In short, existentialists admit that the methodological resources we use for the production of knowledge are not identical with God. In a nutshell, we're not gods. So this leads to a variety of issues. Now, one of them I'm going to start with, when I talked about the idea that thought must be white and experience must be color, is that it, um, in a way to reformulate it, is that the presupposition of what's called mainstream and dominant philosophy, they don't really call it out, but as I, but what black folks can call it out. Why don't we just call it philosophy in white? You know? And philosophy in white is like a white family reunion. <laughs> a white family reunion can only be white if there are only white people. Now, some of you may have gone to a black family reunion or a Latino family reunion or an Asian family reunion. And one of the things you know about the world of color is you invite the whole family. So at a black family reunion, 
The white relatives are at least invited, but they don't want to show up. You know that. <laughs> but often, and, and all my life, I've gone to black families, and I see white people. I've got Asia, my relatives, are Asia, my relatives from all over the world. When I even travel to, I, they're all there. So if so many in this country, if so many black people relate to white people, then if they're not black people at the white family reunion, it's because they were not invited. Because we know most white people in America are related. Biological to black people. <clears throat> so if you put it at the epistemic level, that's one of the parts, features of the decadence happening in the academy. And in philosophy. It's like having as your curric as your syllabus, as your curriculum, a reunion in which you just don't invite the relatives. And the thing about it is, these may be crucial relatives because, you know, some of them may be great grandma or great grandpa. Or you know, you may or you may not notice that that gardener around the corner may be one of the relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so within that framework, we begin to see something. Okay. If you say philosophy in black, you already see something that's happening because people naively think this is about symmetrical argumentation. So they think white and black, but white and black were never symmetrical. Because white defines itself as the absence of black. But black can have white in it and still be black. Black is relational. And once it's relational, it has a different relationship to reality. We begin to see this, but as Charles Ephraim, one of the people from the list point out, he saw this as a problem actually going all the way back in ancient Greek philosophy. Because if we know that there were debates between Parmenides and Heraclitus you know, Plato tried to bring the fusion in. And, but the problem is, even the very language is defined as somehow bringing light to it means you eliminate the darkness. But we all know the truth. The lights may be on, but you never really eliminate the darkness. In fact, the darkness may be a necessary condition for there to be light. And so if you see the intimate relationship between it, you begin to realize that a lot of what we try to do in philosophy may be to create suppressed terms that help us lie to ourselves about what reality is. It's more why, it's bad faith. And so paradoxically and ironically, blackness is more inclusive. You see politically and concretely, because you know when people are mixed, they live in black neighborhoods. I know that people go around, because the truth is, uh, this, the narcissism and the desires of a lot of the, the dominant white world want to believe that same truth. And you know, so they want people, for instance, who are mixed to say, I'm rejected by white and I'm rejected by black. Mm -hmm. But it's complete crap. The reason is, just look at facts. Historically, blackness is where you go when you're not white. And we see it also at the level of creativity. Look, what created everything from the Zeppelin Beatles all the way through at the level of popular culture, was a moment in which some white people realized it's okay to shake the blues. <laughs> okay? And for them, remember, they were trying to play the blues. So once we begin to realize this, we begin to see that if you now shift from that, from ancient Kemet, Egypt is actually the Greek name for Kemet. China, what we have to do is to realize that we are in peril if we ignore the epistemic conditions, what's involved in the erasure of the darkness, the blackness of the shadows. Now, the re phenomenological response is straightforward. I mentioned I like to suppose you. A lot of people like to bring up Plato's Republic. And you know, everybody knows the allegory of the cave. And Plato the care is, oh, you're looking at shadows and appearance. But what every phenomenologist knows is that, that Plato is, is a problem there. You see? Because what Plato is defining as a really real requires ignoring the fact that appearance is reality. In other words, appearance appears. And this was one of Husserl's insights. What he was doing is privileging a different type of appearance. Because even with the forms, their disclosure is just another layer, it's just formal appearance versus concrete lived reality. And that has historical political consequences because, of course, repression of embodied reality, repression of enfleshment, 
A lot of those things connect to what existentialists pay a lot of attention to, particularly people like Beauvoir, Fanon, Richard Wright. A lot of the people we we'll look at, if you look in the in traditions, including Arabindo talked about the spirit, but he took the body, the flesh seriously. Even many people in this room don't know that the Star of David, what we all look at as a Jewish symbol, is a Hindu symbol. Right? Because Jews went over the world and adopted things. And the symbol, what it really represents, is the first triangle is going down to the material, the second triangle is going up to the spiritual. But the point of the symbol is that they meet. Okay? Now all of this leads to all kinds of issues that take seriously in how we deal with the darkness. And the way I'm using darkness here is intentionally broad. So there are ways, for instance, we deal with the darkness, for instance, that will stimulate forms of melancholia. We forget that melancholia originally was a disease that was literally meant to be a physical blackness, black violence in the body. Freud did changes with it, but its basic point was about this Manichaean physicality. And when we think about this, in the modern world, there is a form of ironic melancholia. Because if you think about the people who are produced by the modern world, I don't have time to get into details, but the short version is, a lot of black people didn't have any reason before the emergence of what happened in the 15th century. You know, I, I teach my students the truth, which is not Columbus wasn't exploring, it was on a reconnaissance mission. It was a war with the Afro-Arabic world. And this was about, you know, and so within that framework, a lot of people did not have any reason for themselves black. They were told they were black. They didn't have reason for themselves African. They were Igbo, the Rupa, Koyo, they weren't, even African isn't an African, or an African. Now this doesn't mean, by the way, within that framework, that there's certain other things I'm gonna to get to. We shouldn't have known those things, but I'm gonna to get to them. But, but the main point is, black people, blackness in this form, is through and through indigenous to the modern world, okay? Interestingly enough, woman as we understand it, is also indigenous to it. Because remember, in antiquity, Aristotle's world, all woman was, female was an undeveloped man. But in our world, there's something radically different when we say woman or sex, again, something radically different. But here's the thing. The ironic part is that although we're indigenous to the modern world, it's a world that rejects us, linked into that line about the repression of the darkness and the assertion of the light. To put it in a different language, the paradox and irony of black existence is that we're indigenous, I'm sorry, we're rejected by the only world to which we are indigenous. Our belonging is a form of not belonging. You see? And this irony leads to many issues. Now, there's some very interesting developments along this line. Oh, some of you, this isn't a context in which I speak about existential philosophy, but some of you know I'm in other disciplines as well. I always say I'm also a philosopher, which makes me a proper existentialist. <laughs> <laughs> but some of you know I do work in theoretical physics too. And one of the things that when one, some people, this is something that would really bother a lot of that philosophy. They don't know this. But when you meet with people who advance theoretical physics, they actually they say that they can't they can't stand up the other philosophy. And and you say why? They say they don't know science. And would you believe that? Because that's considered the same, but they're working with positivist science, animistic level. When you talk to theoretical physicists, particularly quantum theory, do you know what they say they do? Phenomenology. Now why do they say they do phenomenology? is because they start from a fundamental principle of relationality. And the very structure of the universe, as they deal with the cosmology, actually has the form of intentionality. And it's on that basis, a lot of the things that people such as Husserl, but not just Husserl, you'll see these things argued. If you read Arabindo on modern science, it's, and he works in transcendental Hindu phenomenology, he is right on point with quantum theory. And so, but one of the things that they take seriously, why they're able to do this, is because they take very seriously, all right? They take very seriously the darkness and the light. Now you can say, what do I mean by that? Well, if you, I'll give you a simple aggregate. 
Plato we know says forms. Forms, formality, this one talks about formal transcendental logic, but it's straightforward. Form formality means that you are able to create a series and algorithm. And so it means that given the rules of the axiom, you know what's next in the equation. So it means that for as a condition of rationality, you could say the steps go here, the next step does not contradict with the previous steps, so down the line there's no contradiction. So it leads to maximum contradiction. Got it? To be consistent, and because of that, it needs to be complete. And that's what created a crisis in science and logic. Because of course, the question then is raised, is logic logical? Is science scientific? Now, the reason this becomes very interesting is because there's a big problem. If you want logic to be complete, it means no stone goes unturned. But this leads to a very big problem. Because if we pick the world we live in, and the word has it, it's called the human world. You may notice something peculiar. Something very peculiar. In my classes, some of my students here, they know I give it, I, I give it a very concrete example. The concrete example is, I know with absolute certainty, nobody in this room would love to be married to, dating, or have as a partner in life a person who is maximally consistent. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? <laughs> and what's interesting is the language you use if you were with a person who is maximally consistent. Do you know what you say when you're fighting? You know, um, hopefully they're not shot objects around. <laughs> but what you say is, you're not being reasonable. And what this tells you is something very, very, very important. That reason is broader than rationality. And once reason is broader than rationality, you're now in a different terrain because you see a lot of people thought about existentialism in terms of being rationalism. A lot of people thought in terms, but a lot of people don't realize the world beyond the, the dichotomy, the false dichotomy of rationality and irrationality. And within that world, you begin to talk about things in very different ways. So, for instance, why must the old model says truth happens if you distance yourself? But that's complete BS. There, there's a whole world of truth that happens. When you connect, impassioned truth. People say love is blind, for instance. That's complete prop. When you're in love, you pay attention to your lover in detail. And it's not like when you love someone, you don't know the infelicities, the, in the blemishes. Come on, you all know the person you love has the cutest mole. <laughs> you know? The quad ripple chin is the way it shakes when they laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and come on, you're not going to win. Ordinary people sit and have a conversation while they're doing number two. <laughs> but love, and you know it stinks. <laughs> but love, love does. And there are all kinds of things you do with love. I'm not going to get into these. <laughs> but, but let me just say, that you're well aware at, at many levels of what this is about. In love, for instance, if your lover is diseased or ill, you will wash your lover's body. There are people who are dying of AIDS whose lover isn't, who will kiss and hold that person. When my cousin many years ago was, this is before, you know, when he was diagnosed, uh, with having just six weeks to live. I remember distinctly, I went to visit him in Atlanta, and um, that's when they would, as if you're, you know, they would shove a tray, metal tray, because nobody would go in the room that AIDS patient. And he was just informed that he had six weeks to get his talk. And, you know, what I did was, I went on the bed, and what are you supposed to do? Held my cousin in my arms, and we spent the night just lying down together. That's what you do when you love someone. Now, it's not that I didn't know he had AIDS. It's not that I didn't know what is, you know, or even with one's children or one's, it's not that you don't know, you see what I'm getting at? You know that, and that's the whole point. What people in love do is pay attention. In fact, the first period of get together, you're staring at each other all the time. So this tells you something, because if you put it at an epistemic level, when you're in disciplines, the people who train you in the wrong way make you survive getting your PhD. The people who train you in the right way 
put you in touch with why you fell in love with the pursuit of knowledge. And that animates an in-depth, detailed, passionate for the rest of your life engagement with a search for truth and an understanding of reality. I bring this up because one of the things that we begin to understand then is that when you do this in the other version, you're, you're sterilizing reality to get the form. This other version, of course, you're steeping yourself in reality, which means you're facing its contradictions. You see what I'm saying? So for instance, when you really love someone, you do fight. But the fight doesn't mean that you're breaking up the your party. It means you're working out the contradictions. Now this is crucial. This is what Jane Gordon calls creolization. And what she means by that is, we intellectually have a problem of dealing with mixture, a lot of us are in society, because we think mixtures are about resolving. My son is bar mitzvah speech, for instance, you know, we relate to almost every human group. And what he points out, he said, is that people expect you to be like that example, oh, am I white, am I black, am I Indian, am I Chinese? And he says, actually, he says, it's really cool, because everywhere I go, I just be relatives. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? He knows well, all the things he is, but he's not focusing it in terms of what he's not. And that means that it's a connectedness that enables him actually to learn more. Okay? And so what creolization is, is one of these examples. The mixtures are not a pollution. The mixtures are a facilitation that enables the method, enables the emergence of that which you didn't see before. When I said a teleological suspension of disciplinarity, for instance, a lot of people, when you say you get into trouble in a, in a discipline because the method doesn't answer everything, they think it means now you get a bunch of other disciplines together to be interdisciplinary. It's wrong because it's treating each discipline as ontologically complete, as whole. What, you, what actually privilization is about, and a teleological suspension of disciplinarity is about, is that you actually are communicating about reality which means you may produce new disciplines. And this is where I'm leading up to some of the issues we have to deal with. Because you see, what happens with the error many people, error many people make, is that they think in a substance way that you have an intact, complete system. You just have to put others in. So a lot of people think, for instance, with philosophy, or even when I talked about existentialism, or what we're doing in this room, a lot of people think that you could just put this diversity in, but keep the system as it is. <coughs> Ain't happening. <laughs> Won't work. <clears throat> you see, and the reason is, if what was excluded, if we understand ourselves as relations and relationships, if what you're bringing in is a new relationship, not a thing, that means the previous relationship, which defined itself as your exclusion, is changed which means a new relation is established. You see what I'm getting at? A lot of people thought you could just bring women in, but keep things the same. A lot of trying to do that. They don't realize. They just want to, in that case, they just want to create men with female genitals. <laughs> the fact is, bringing women in means changing men. You can't have this, the, that kind of man has to change. A lot of people think you could just add blacks. You can't. You can't do it. It requires thinking doing things in different ways. And blacks who have been encouraged to just be <laughs> something added in are almost always you are many commit suicide, lose, lose profession, because at the end of the day, it's not right. And it's not an ontological not right, you see what I'm getting at? It's a relational not right. And once we begin to understand that, this is something that Beauvoir and many others have thought about. Now I'm going to move through the rest very quickly because I know we're all tired and we'd like to be, but the short version would be this. One of the things we, we, we one, among the people who think about these issues is Fanon. And we know Fanon, for instance, argued about the decolonization of method. Fanon basically talked about the concepts of failure and Fanon was constantly raising the question of the developmental aspect of being a human being because Fanon knew that his job was to do something he considered obscene. Fanon was being asked as a psychiatrist, in effect, to make his subjects, if they were black or female or Arab or 
whatever to exclude category at home in a world premised on their exclusion. His job was to create a happy slave. And what Fanon realized is you can't do that. Every one of his writings show that you need to create a different system, a different set of relations. And that's how you're going to deal with that. So you had to deal with the concept of health, which required establishing a different kind of relationship. But even within that framework, there are these moments, there's some things that we have to call Fanon. Ah, one of the things, of course, is a lot of people were perplexed because Fanon had, in an English translation, it's actually, it should say, discontent or unhappiness. You know, the old English translations of the tragedy of the man is that he was a child. A lot of people went all the way, they said Nietzsche said it, and then people said, that's not from Soviet. Well, we all know who said that. It was Simone de Beauvoir. It was the ethics of ambiguity, and the reason I know Fred on Ready for Learn is because if you look at it, yeah, he had a books in the library, he had it stuff online. For whatever reason, he cited it wrong. But what's important if it were cited right is we know Simone Beauvoir's connection through Richard Wright, which Peg Simons point out very well, means that you could see an interesting relationship of Beauvoir to Fanon. Because <laughs> Fanon has Blanc, that's in white mass, it's really a two-part text. Where the second part we get into an experience with Kuhl. He just puts the noir. The experience is the second volume of second sense. But where Fanon and Beauvoir are different is that Fanon first starts with this um, question of experience at autobiographical levels. But as he does this interrogation, Fanon begins, his, his goal is not only interrogation of human sciences, but he does something very extraordinary. He ends the chapter, experience with the Noir, the lived experience of the Noir, with weeping, crying. And a lot of people don't pay attention to what a psychiatrist talking about crying means. Some of you, I won't ask who, have had therapy. <laughs> and as you know, the breakthrough moment in therapy is when, because at first you go to talk and you give jokes and you say, you know, I know you can sick people, but you know, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but and, you know, it's like the, the therapist knows. <laughs> but you know, eventually, one day, you break down. Oh my God, I'm terrible. I want to sleep with my mother, my father, and the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we know what the therapist says, now we can begin. <laughs> Well, you see, tears, as we know, and Sartre wrote about this too, and it's not like the emotions, but tears uh, are the moment where you're having trouble dealing with you. And it's interesting, it's water, it washes away what is in the way. And you notice when you wake up the next day, you often cry, for instance, if you're bereaved, you find out about a loved one dying. You don't want to face it as real, but when you wake up, you're ready to face the reality. And the reality each brings <coughs> as you face is in, in, the in the chapter of psychopathology and the the issue is there's no coherent notion of what it is to be normal in your life. If you're, most people consider, you know, the Snoop Dogg dog type image and so forth, you know, you know, you know the image, you get up in the morning, you you get your gin and juice, you push your nine women off to bed, and you go to the ghetto ATM, which is the local interest store, you know, that kind of thing. They, you know, that's pathological. But then if you're not that, and you're like some of you in this room, and you're a scholar, and they say, well, you're, you're not really black, you're not really Latino, you're not really, you know, you're not real religion. You see what I'm getting at? When you are what a person in your profession, your skills are supposed to be. And his point is that the conception of authenticity is problematic because if it is defined to you as intrinsically pathological, you cannot say that. So you need a different system. And so I want to conclude with just two remarks. <coughs> the first one is the way I talk about these issues in the world philosophy, you need to deal with, I've been outlining issues of philosophical anthropology and existentialism, the issues of freedom. And they're just contributory issues because this has been a meta, a, 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 a meta critical discussion of reason itself. And these are all issues of existentialists do. Every existentialist has a meta critique of reason. But I want to close with two things. One is going to be on our training. And the reason that becomes important because what 
I opened it with about experience and thought, is that what every one of us in this room understands and knows is the profound importance of knowledge, of thinking, for the practices of freedom. We know this. But one of the things we, have to, we also know is if you think relationally, you know it's not as simple as saying you have knowledge. One of the best examples for this is Frederick Douglass. So I'm going to call, but I don't have two people, I'm going to talk about Frederick Douglass and Anna Julia Cooper. Now Frederick Douglass, many of you all know, I already brought him up, I bondage my, but I'm going to talk about my bondage my friend. You know he was enslaved, you know that his master made his father, you know that he was separated from his mother, and you know the whole project was to make him property. In fact, C.L.R. James has written on this peculiar phenomenon. Because you see, one of the weird things about property in the context of racialized slavery, everybody knows property normally is something you take care of. You know what I mean? When people have their property, you know, you, know, you take care of them. You the lawn, you, you, you wax the walls, you know, C.R. James said in my chapter, this chapter of property, what's bizarre about racialized slavery is the violence and the abuse. Why do they need to rape, pillage, scar, burn, eviscerate all the names you have, put gunpowder up the anus, blow them up, uh, the lynchings, why was all that have to do it? CLR James said it's because of the kids them, torture them, mutilate you can do whatever you like, you know deep down it's because they remain irrefutably above all human beings. It's because modern racism knows that black people, indigenous peoples, Women, all these categories of human beings is why the violence is there. And so Frederick Douglass, in the midst of this, is separated from his mother. But at a certain point, the, the project is to make Frederick Douglass believe he is exclusively property. However, his mother, and I've talked about this in other, in other contexts, his mother was 12 miles away, walked to go see him when he was seven, to spend time with him. Now, when she did this, it was with great danger. 12 miles doesn't sound much when you have cars and, you know, but you have to picture Maryland, which is cold in winter. What is to be a black woman walking 12 miles through those fields? Not only the animals, the possibility of people who have molest you, the people who would consider you an escaped slave, the risk she took to be with that child. And then she was dead. One of the things whenever I brought this up to my students, I mentioned to them, what if you heard your mother did all that just to spend time with you? And you didn't know your mother. It's bare reflections, bare, bare images of her. And they all got the point. What you would say are the words, I don't know her, but I know this. She loved me. Love brings onto you a value that's external to property. When you're loved, your existence as a relationship in which there's someone for whom you're not being in the world is a loss in the world. So in a world that says your only value is to be property of a master, what do you make of love? And it's no accident if you look at a lot of black radical writings. A lot. It, it's interesting, it's across the spectrum of logic, from post-structuralist, post-modernist, Marxist, you know, liberal, even conservatives, they all talk about love. And so we start with the revolutionary potential of love. But you know, and Tina Turner said, you know, that's love gotta do it. Love is love can make you have a sense of your value. But, it, but the next thing that Douglas talked about was the value of learning to read and write. That's what we do, right? We're in the profession of literacy. And what he began to learn from reading and writing is that the whites surrounding were not gods. He could learn and do what they do. So writing, language, gave him access to the demystifying of a group of people. Words, the elevation of whites into gods was taken down, and the realization of, of what it is to question what is not a God and what a human relationship emerged. But that had to be stopped. And as we know, there was an effort to beat Frederick Douglass back into 
the previous condition by a slave race named Cody. And that forced Frankie Douglas is Abdul Jamal Mohammed, who's, who's here, but unfortunately uh, ill. Um, they need the right thing, but um, I hope he gets better by tomorrow. The, um, the thing that he began to realize is he had to make a decision around freedom in relation to death. If you, and in that relationship of freedom to death, what I find interesting is when he fought back the slave breaker, to stand up against a slave breaker, you risk death. He could have killed the man because Frederick Douglass was stronger. He didn't kill him. He fought him enough to make sure he did not, that, he, that Douglass stood up for his dignity. His goal wasn't to kill another human being. In other words, that fight, that act, that could be read as violence facing death was an act of ethics, was ethical. And when he escaped for freedom, he could have kept running Canada. But what he did instead was stay in this country where, as we know, the Fugitive Slave Act, he could have been brought back. In fact, in this country, as we know, his books, his books, if someone were to plagiarize them, it would be violating the law. His books had more rights than he. This is the argument I used to have with the, the ultra textualists. They want to defend everything as a text. I said, look, your text was more rights than like And so at the point at which he began to notice he was in a political struggle, but his understanding of freedom as a relational struggle. Remember, Douglas was with the women's movement. Douglas was with indigenous movement. Douglas was with, was with many movements. And this comes to the close. Now, this question of freedom, you notice, is developmental. And one of the things I've noticed about all existentialists, in particularly Book Walk, if you look at her writing, she was really concerned about what maturation is. Fanon was concerned with this. Rice, many others to the, to the present. And this question is because once you don't look at a complete notion, you know, a lot of political laws, a lot of moral laws, we treat human beings as if we come out of the vagina, boom, fully fledged moral agents ready to go. But once you understand that people have to be cultivated into ethics, into political life, you ask, what is this about? And this is something Anna Julia Cooper, as an educator, after education, took very seriously. We know she had a theory of value in which that connects to this room, because everybody in this room, we are there to do this meeting, and even though we did our best with resources, the fact of the matter is, we have fewer resources than many other organizations have. It's just that because we're connected to something living and valuable, we bring a value to it that exceeds the investment. So Anna Julia Cooper was right there. But the other thing that she was insightful about, and she wrote that Jane Doe wrote in her essay on the book about <laughs> laughter. And Anna Julia Cooper also understood that freedom is a cultivated activity. Okay? And in that cultivated activity, you develop relationships. And those relationships become relationships in which you learn not only skills, talents, and understanding, but you also learn the practices of what's involved <laughs> in a kind of valuing in which you can appreciate being valued, not in the dialectics of recognition with those who reject you, but learn to value those who respect and value you. What is powerful about this gathering is that the very, the very demographic, intellectual diversity of this room is a manifestation of a community that understands, as Douglas understood, that woman who came in his childhood, the value of valuing what she had to offer. Connection to reality of what it is to deal with the larger model of reason, the larger model of thinking, the difficult, demanding question of existence is at the heart of it a value that matters. And I'm done. <laughs>